We're going to continue in a series we started a number of weeks back, and uh, I'm excited to get back on this one because it's a subject that I don't teach on often because I, I like to stay on the good news. <laughs> and this can sound like it's not good news, but really it is. And uh, uh, what we started was a series called How to Experience the Real Christian Life by Exposing the Enemy's Battle Plan. Um, it was kind of cool. The, the, first, the first two weeks uh, dealt with a pretty intense subject. So I'm going to recap this. And so if you uh, were gone for the last two weeks, you didn't miss a thing. Uh, we're right on track. We're just going to keep going. Here's what we covered last time. John 10.10. 10. The question I would ask before you read this is, are you experiencing the abundant life? You have it. It's in you. Christ Jesus is the abundant life. But are you experiencing it? And in the book of John, it says, I have come so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. That's good news. Can you dream of good life? How about it? Can you dream of a really good vacation? Yes, of course. And some of you post it all on Facebook, <laughs> especially when you're down there and we're stuck in the cold here and you're going, ha ha, see how nice it is in the beach and the palm trees and all that fun stuff. Well, if you can dream of that, think of how much more the abundant life can look. What does abundant life mean? I think it just means Christ expressing himself the way he intended to through you as you believe what he says about you. So it's like him working out things in your life, working out through your soul, out through your body. And it's, a, it's a very great experience. Well, the thing that we covered uh, in the series is this. In 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, So that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. I have a funny feeling typical church people don't realize there's something else going on out there. The spiritual world is very real. And there's stuff going on behind the scenes that we may not be aware of. And I want to highlight it. I want to put my finger on it and say, hey, are you aware of this? Perhaps you will experience freedom in an area of your life you're, you've been trying to figure out for a long time. Hopefully the Holy Spirit will use this. So in the New American Standard Bible, it says, so that no advantage will be taken of you by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. And the series is covering three major attacks that I believe Satan uses against us. He's real, but i got to say again, he's not omnipresent. He's a created creature. He's not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. He's none of that. Sometimes we give him equal God status. One of the worst pictures I've ever seen is this uh, uh, Jesus and the devil uh, arm wrestling as if it's an even match. <laughs> really? Not a chance. Do you understand the picture? We've elevated the power of Satan with the power of Christ. There is not even a close comparison, not even a smidgen. It's like a tiny little ant. That's it. It's a, that's how distant it is from the truth. All right? You've got to know some things about the enemy. If you don't, you could get run over. It's like a country being invaded. Spies have gone in ahead of time, found the vulnerabilities, and it was an easy attack. But if you're prepared and you know what's coming... You can put up a good fight. And the good news is, for you and I as believers, the battle is already won. Amen. You are victorious. You've already got victory. Now, I have to admit, I come from a more of a conservative background. So uh, even though I'm, my personality may not be really conservative, but I come from that background. And so to say to me, the victory is yours. You've already won. Uh, you have the power. And terminology that, in my experience, I may not see, um, I have a hard time with that sometimes, especially with words like, you already have this. You, you, whatever. You can, you can find out whatever. Um, oh, how do I say this carefully? Let's just say, there are, in the charismatic camps, and they love Jesus just as much as you, all right? They're just, they're wired differently emotionally and in that there's room for everybody but in those camps because i don't see and from that lens very well some of the terminology coming from that drives me nuts but now i'm starting to see wait a minute just because it drives me nuts doesn't mean that they're wrong it means they see something i can't see 
just like they may be frustrated with our terminology to so speak more truth. <laughs> you know, well, hang on. You, you can see how you get into his struggles. And we're going to cover in just a few minutes a reminder that the battle is not between us. So the terminology that I have the battle won, that I am victorious, that I have the life of Christ already in me, it's true whether you believe it or not. But when you believe it, you actually enter in and experience it in a very, very different way. And that's why I'm doing the series. Three attacks. The first one's called the temptation attack. That's what we covered the last two weeks. So how temptation comes in and gets us, and I'll look at some verses on that as a recap. Today we're going to cover the accusation attack. How the accuser comes and starts to speak lies into our minds. This is a big one. All right? And the last one called the deception attack, we'll cover that uh, when we get done, accusation attack. Let's recap where this temptation thing comes in. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Another translation called the mirror writes this, People are not the enemy, whether they be husbands, wives, children, or parents, slaves, or bosses. They might host hostile, law-inspired thought patterns through their unbelief or ignorance, but to target one another is to engage in wrong combat. We represent the authority of the victory of Christ in the spiritual realm. We are positioned there in Christ. We target the mind games and structures of darkness, religious thought patterns, governing and conditioning human behavior. The battle is not with one another. Never has been. And unfortunately, it may feel like it really is. And a person not knowing this can really hate on somebody. You know, let's say I'll pick on my brother-in-law, Kevin. We're always nice to each other. We never argue. <laughs> I'm always right. You know, it's easy. We get along great. But let's say something comes up, and he and I could start sparring. He's bigger than me, so i got to be really careful here. <laughs> um, but he and I could think, uh, I could think he's a real jerk. I really can think that, and he can act like it. And I can forget that he isn't, but he's acting like it. Okay? So now I see Kevin. What Jesus is telling me, Kevin's not the problem. Your view of him as jerk is not true. But in my mind, it's true. So the Holy Spirit's saying, uh-uh, I want you to renew your mind. You don't know people after their flesh patterns anymore. Just the way he would see me as equally a jerk in the same way. So I can look at Kevin now, and I can see Jesus Christ in him. That's his real nature. That's his true identity. That's the real him. Same thing. I'm begging him in the same way. Lord, reveal to him. I am a saint. I am one with Christ. And I may not be acting like it all the time. Just like all of us. We're not always acting like who we are. And so we, have, we send mixed messages to people. And we need to understand that the battle we have is not human. Except we live in a human world. We have to learn how to get along. And so the scripture is teaching us to get our minds renewed. That's the problem. The battle's up here in our thinking. We need to know who we are. And if we know who we are, then we start to see others according to who they are. So it, it, it's perfect. It's wonderful. Next one. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Mirror translation says, your situation is not unique. Every human life faces contradictions. Here's the good news. God believes in your freedom. He has made it possible for you to triumph in every situation that you will ever encounter. And lastly from the message, no test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be punished pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. Powerful picture. Now, here's something important. This verse has been taken out of context when it comes to human suffering, human problems. People have declared, God won't let anything happen to you beyond what you can handle. He'll never let more come on you than what you were able to endure. 
That is not what this says at all. The word temptation there is the incitement, enticement to sin, trying to lure you into it. God will never do that. But he does allow stuff in our lives. He does allow us to face suffering for a number of reasons. I don't, I, I don't have the, the full list because that's God's list. His, he, he sees our unique circumstances better. But one of the reasons, when we enter difficult circumstances, it opens up mercy in us in areas we could never have experienced insight. If you've been through something quite terrible, you've had a death in the family, you now identify with death better than had you not. If you've been divorced, same thing. You have an insight into that pain and struggle, the journey that I can't know personally. I don't ever want to and never will. But there is an identifying uh, that happens, a merciful thing that happens as a gift to us. I don't know how or why. I'm not God, but I trust him as the God of outcomes. And that, listen to this, he will work everything together for the good of those who are in Christ. Everything. The circumstance in your head right now, the worry you have, he will work it out according to his plan. It may look very different than your plan. And that's okay. James 1, 13 and 15 says, And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God's tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from your own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. When sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. I like this translation. Do not say, I am scrutinized by God. When you feel enticed, he is not in the teasing business. Evil offers no attraction to God for God to be tempted by it. Neither is he experimenting with your design. <laughs> Temptation employs lust to lure someone into a trap, just like hunting or fishing. One is deceived by the attraction of bait. Your own private desires can snare you. When passion conceives it, becomes the parent of sin. Sin's mission is to murder you. Temptation is a big deal. Open your eyes. There are temptations around. Not to go looking for the temptations. Not what, not what I meant. But open your eyes to the awareness of that reality. Well, time to dig in. What's the second attack? In Revelation 12, verse 10 to 11, John writes, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has come at last! Salvation and power in the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. Somebody's accusing. Hmm. And the message translation says, Then I heard a strong voice out of heaven saying, Salvation and power are established. Kingdom of our God, authority of his Messiah. The accuser of our brothers and sisters thrown out. Who accused them day and night? There is a nagging voice that will not go away until we experience heaven. That is the voice of accusation and lies. And it happens here. It speaks into our minds. Its source is not from your identity. It's not from your real nature. There's not two of you in you. There's only one. And that's really important to look at. One day when the angels came to report to God, Satan, who was the designated accuser. Hmm, there it is again. He's an accuser. So what, what do we do then? How do we move on? How does he accuse us? And this is kind of cool. Let's see if I can find my notes. The first accusation, there's two big ones, and hopefully we'll get through them. I don't know. The first one that he accuses us with is by condemning our conscience. By condemning our conscience, I would recommend that you revisit and try and rediscover what is conscience. I'm not going to ask you as a rhetorical, it's a rhetorical question. I want you to think it through and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is conscience. I don't believe it's what I thought it was anymore. And I don't believe Adam and Eve had a conscience before they sinned. God was there all. Something happened. 
You can't even trust your conscience. You can trust the Holy Spirit, but not your conscience. Sometimes we mix up conscience with the voice of God. And then I hear people say, well, God told me. Really? I'm going to recommend we stop using the term God told me until you have a really good trusting relationship with the person. All right? You can say God's word says, but a lot of people flout this idea, God told me to do this. Well, there's no more argument. They're in the full power seat control, cannot be challenged. Because who can challenge what they have said? I can't. If God told me, told them. But it shuts out every argument. So to use it in a slang-free way that I've heard in the typical Western church, God told me this, God told me that, uh, find new ways to communicate it so you open the door for conversation. Stuff like, can I share with you something I think God's been sharing with me or showing me? And uh, it's, it's been a really cool journey. And then you start to share what it is. You know, here's, here's what it, I, it seems like God might be speaking to my mind. I've got this hunch. You know, it, what it does, it opens the door to, listen to this, being teachable. To have others hear and say, you should never be afraid of having a very serious issue that you think is God, be able to share it with some trusted individual. Say, hey, can you help me and see if, this, if you sense too that this is the will of God? Because if you don't, guess what? Then you're on your own little island. And that's a dangerous place to be. And then out of pride, you dare not fail. Of course it was God who told me. I don't know what reason. Really, I'm... Do you understand what I mean by don't use the line God told me as much anymore? The intent of it. Does God speak? Yes. But when we use that as leverage in the church to shut down arguments and plow our way through, uh, I've seen it abused way more often than I've ever seen it well placed. Condemning our conscience. The accuser comes along and he likes to accuse us, speak lies into us. If he can't work on enticing you to tempt you to sin, then he's going to try to keep you from relying on Jesus Christ as your life by starting to tell you lies. He accuses us by planning thoughts. And by the way, let's say he does convince you to pull through on a sin. First he tricked you into it. And then when you do, he accuses you of doing it. It's like a double whammy. Not fair. It's not fair. That's, who says it's fair? That's why it's a big deception that we need to be aware of what's going on. He's going to start accusing you with questions like, how in the world could you have done that? You're a Christian, you say. You say you love God. So how can you do that? For the Bible says, if you do this, the love of Christ is in you. And he starts using scripture to attack you. And now you got all this, oh, oh yeah, it does say that. Oh, no, I'm a terrible person. What have I done? Okay? Like, you, you, the cycle is vicious. And then the left hook is, oh, I thought you knew Christ. Maybe you aren't saved. Maybe he really isn't your life and you still have more to do. You're not cleaned up enough. All these lies and just bombardment, bombardment, bombardment. It, it's real. In order to prevent you from being useful, he plants thoughts like this. Who am I that God could use me? Because if everybody really, really, really knew me, they would never ask me to do that. Oh, I'm just, I'm no good at this. I am unworthy. I'm no good at anything. I'm going to go to the garden and eat some worms, you know. The, the lies start filling in, and they come when we're most vulnerable, and it's scary. But if you can listen to the Holy Spirit prompting you, saying, hey, a uh, lie alarm going off, hello, that's not true. Then you can say, oh, wait a minute, that's not true. I reject that. That thought never came from Jesus Christ. Another one, that he, uh, a thing that comes along. Um, after all I have done, there's no way I could ever be used. Sometimes we have a hard time forgiving ourselves in the past. This is a big one. This is the constant guilt and shame. By the way, that will be saved up for the last uh, part of the series. The accuser is also going to come along and start talking to you about the love of God. 
That's weird. He's going to say, but who am I that, would, that God would really love me? I know the Bible says that he does, but I know me. And anybody in their right mind couldn't love this. Have you ever heard that in your mind? Have you heard others say it to themselves? I'm, I'm sure you have. These are common lies. I don't know why we keep getting duped in the same patterns. It's time to go back to the truth. What does God say about you? God knows you inside and out. Inside and out. Even from before you were born. Adam and Eve also experienced a sense of shame and embarrassment and condemnation immediately after they sinned. A conscience was activated. Listen to this. And listen carefully. The Word of God clearly states this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, the Mirror Bible says, Now the decisive conclusion is this. In Christ, every bit of condemning evidence against us is canceled. God holds nothing against you. And he never will. Ever. But you don't know what I did or what I want to do. No, I don't. But I know what the word of God says. I know what happened at the cross. I know why Jesus died. He took it away. You are free. And any condemning voice never comes from God. It can come into our thoughts by being planted. It can come through people who accuse us. Those who are receiving accusing messages from either a spouse or a friend, a worker, co-worker, carry around a mirror and reject the lies coming at you. Not physically a mirror, but in your mind, a mirror. So that when the lies come at you, just, mm -mm, I am not taking your junk. I am not taking the lies. Repel it back at you because this body is not receiving it. I am free. I am not condemned. I am holy. I am righteous. I am pure. I am clean. I am forgiven. And there's nothing that will ever separate me from the love of God, which is revealed in Christ Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. You're in Christ Jesus. Imagine that. Don't let the lies consume you. The accusing voice is powerful and super sneaky. Listen to this. The answer to accusation is this. Confession. Oh, by the way, I have to tell you some more really good news. Really, really good news. God Almighty, creator of the universe, lover of all people, has seen you at your worst. And you can't surprise him. He's not going to go, Did you see that? Angels, come here. Mm. That's never going to happen. You're allowed to be free and honest before God. And if you're in patterns of behaviors you're embarrassed about and that are incorrect, because there are wrong behaviors, Scripture encourages us, those who know who we are in Christ, stop sinning. It doesn't look good on you. I'm free to. Of course you're free, but you're also free not to. And the word of God through the Holy Spirit is saying, stop it. Stop. It's not a reflection of me. That's a fleshly reflection. And I ain't the real you anyway. So let's get rid of it. He has seen you at your worst, and he loves you. He completely accepts you. That's hard to take in. We may have a hard enough time accepting ourselves when we screw up but he fully accepts you. Nothing ever occurs to God. You can't throw him off and hug. He'll never say, <gasps> never saw that one coming. Holy smokes. That's a new one. <laughs> That's another line he'll never use. <laughs> He's seen you at your worst and he loves you. That's really good news. So confession. What do we do with confession? Confession is this. That's the Greek word for it and the definition. Listen to this. This is really good news if you don't know what the word confession means. It says to say the same thing as another, to agree with. 
So, let's say you do sin. By the way, the word sin is not as scary as you think. It simply means missing the mark. That's it. All right? So, when we sin and miss the mark of perfection, in our behaviors especially, we are to confess and the word confess means to agree with God. This is not begging for forgiveness, because you are already forgiven. Okay, and side note, just in case you're thinking it, it doesn't mean you have a license to go sin. Okay, really? Those who understand grace know that it is not about continuing in sin. Grace says, say no to ungodliness. But when I do sin, I confess, I agree with God like this. Heavenly Father, I confess, agree with you that I am forgiven. I can't believe it. I love it. Thank you. I confess my forgiveness. I confess my righteousness in Christ. I confess I am one with you. The full payment of sin has been made. I confess the finished work of the cross has made me right with you. I confess I am a new creation. I confess I am not condemned. Can you see how that prayer of confession is different from the traditional one? The one that I grew up with where I had to make the huge list and make sure I say every single sin so it's confessed up just in case I suddenly die so I can go to heaven. But if I miss one, then now I'm not going to heaven because I, I missed one. It's really stupid. The more I think about it, it's getting more and more immature. This is becoming life to me. Understanding confession. In fact, confession is not about the focus on sin. It's about the focus on who? Jesus. Take your eyes off the sin and put your eyes on him and start confessing. Repentance is another powerful word. Repentance means to change your thinking. Do a 180. That's what the word literally means. If you think you're worthless, no good, and you bought into the lies of the accuser, then repent. The end is near. No, I'm kidding. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> wrong sign. <laughs> repent and start to believe what God says about you. Allow your minds to be renewed by him. He does the renewing. You can't even do it. You can't. So it means to concede, not to refuse, to promise, not to deny, to confess, to declare, to profess, to declare openly, speak out freely, to praise, to celebrate. Are you guys into confession now? Now that you see this? I'm into confession. Yeah, I, yeah. You can jump around and do all that fun stuff. But confession, listen to this. Ephesians 6, 13. I'm going to read from two translations. This is huge. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the times, time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth as the, and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so, so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows, arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit sometimes when you feel like it and you're feeling good. It doesn't say that. Pray in the Spirit at all times. There is an implicit command for your benefit. It's for your benefit. Spirit to spirit. Remember, you are one with Jesus. Real prayer doesn't happen out of your mouth. It happens inside. Constantly. Sometimes we have to get it out because we're so distracted. We say it to help one another. But the praying at all times is big. And on some occasions, when things are really crappy, that's when you need to pray. Right? No. On every occasion, the good, the bad, whenever, as you're driving, as you're sitting, all the time. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. There's a whole sermon right there. Think of all the people around the world right now, believers, who are suffering because of their faith. I'm wearing a tie that was given to me by Robinson Sadek from Pakistan. The last two weeks, he has posted on his Facebook a bombing almost every day, an explosion where people are being killed all around him. The riots and very unsafe situations are increasing 
in Karachi. It's a dangerous place, especially for believers. So this is in honor of him. And this is real. The battle's real. Praying for all believers. Do we know what's going on? Or are we going to, listen to this, look at this stay alert business. We're not alert. We're sitting comfortably. We have jobs. We have grocery stores filled with food. We have cable. We have theaters. We can, all this great stuff. And, and there's nothing wrong with those. But those things can dull our senses to what's going on around the world. And dull our senses to recognize there is an attack happening to our spiritual lives. Satan does not want us to rely on Christ. He wants us to believe lies. The battles in the mind is the only power he has. It's the only power he has. Now, I love this. i got to read it to you from the mirror. If you haven't got your copy yet, get it on Kindle or order your copy on Amazon. It is most important, therefore, to acquaint yourself with every aspect of God's armor. Previously, when I taught the armor of God, I saw that already. It was really cool. I saw the armor is not something I have to mentally put on, but rather it's an affirmation of the armor given to me by Christ. Helmet of salvation, knowing I'm one with him. I am righteous. And all, all these things, you can start to look through all the pieces of armor and recognize they are simply affirming your identity in Christ. It's huge. Here, let's go. You are fully fit to powerfully defeat, defeat any onslaught or contradiction on any day of confrontation, triumphantly standing your ground. Did you hear that? You have been equipped. I need more armor, God. The last one stuck. I got it from Kmart, and it's like really bad. Can I have the good stuff? You have been fully equipped. Fully equipped. The days where the law of hardships and annoyances and labor dictated your life are over. Take your position. You have the truth wrapped around your hips like a soldier's belt, holding the complete body armor together. Now your loins are protected so that the enemy can no longer defeat you with lust and sexual sins. Righteousness covers your heart like a bulletproof breastplate. You wear your eagerness and passion to communicate the good news like soldiers' shoes. Practice your footwork. Announce peace. The battle has already been fought and won. It is most important to engage your faith as a man-sized shield that covers your whole person and empowers you to extinguish the flame in every arrow the enemy shoots at you. By the way, the idea of that armor is a full-size thing, full body covering. It's not your little round one you see in some medieval things because you still can get hit all over the place wherever the shield isn't. We're talking like some of our other movies that you see with a full body armor and they have all the shields. This is big, serious shield because it's a serious problem. All right. Um, pondering, uh, ooh, hang on. The on, the on uh, yeah. The only visible part of you is your faith. The word turos means door-sized shield. Pondering redemption realities is your headgear. Pondering redemption realities. Thinking about. What are you choosing to think about? Are you going to think about the distraction that comes at you? It's harder when you have like the spiritual gift of ADD. You can get bombarded all over. It's really hard. But it's still, nevertheless, real. Nevertheless. Here we go. Um, pondering redemption realities is your headgear that protects your mind. Then give voice to the word of God. This is your spiritual sword. Prevail in persistent prayer. Praying in the spirit includes every form of prayer, whether it be prayer of request or prayer of thanksgiving and worship or interceding for the saints. Do not do all the talking. <laughs> I love that. Always be attentive to the voice of the spirit. That's powerful. That's really good news. Confess the armor. Confess. Agree with God. Paul writes, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. 
I've had a chance over the last 23 years of pastoral ministry to get to know a lot of clergy, youth pastors, pastors, and people who are in charge of denominations, and you just get to know them over time. And there's definitely a distinct difference when it comes to young bucks coming out of Bible college who think they know everything, and they really think they know everything. It, it, I know. I was there. <laughs> all right? They, they have all the theology figured out because the book tells them that, but they have zero experience dealing with real people. Are they fully equipped? They are fully equipped, but they're not properly trained yet. So I, I see a gathering of quite young individuals, and they'll speak the gospel bold, and they'll, in your face, I'm right, you're wrong, and you get into these right and wrong battles. Wait a minute. What tree would that be from? That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Many have been trained to eat from that tree. Trained to eat from that tree. Correcting people. You've not been called to correct. You have been called to listen. This is, this is the answer. Love. That's it. You have been called to love. But if you don't know you are loved, then it's going to be very hard for you to love others the way Christ loves you. So there's a journey, an experience, and I'm in that journey now, of continuing to grow in my understanding of how much God loves me, and I'm seeing others differently as I grow in that love. So there's a middle ground. Then I then you meet others who are much older and far more experienced. And my goodness... They, they sometimes don't comment much on the other two groups. Just smile. Hmm. Yep. They'll come around. <laughs> There's a maturing process. There's a changing of your thinking that matures. This changing of your mind, changing the way you think, is a journey. Please don't think you've got the answers right now. That you've arrived at God's understanding for humanity. I haven't arrived. I've been sure shifted in much of my thinking in a good way. And now I have a lot more questions. In a great way, I know one thing for sure. Jesus Christ is my life. I know who I am. And if I exit this world with only that, oh yeah, booyah, whatever. You know, seriously. So the, the battles of theology and fighting that happen... When they become an issue of you're right, I'm wrong, or I'm wrong, you're right, or whatever, those are the wrong discussions. Those never lend to healthy relationships. They're a setup for fighting, which never comes from Christ like that. Not especially in the body of Christ. So we can stop all that. It says in the New American Standard Bible, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the mirror says, do not allow current religious tradition to mold you into its pattern of reasoning. <laughs> like an inspired artist, give attention to the detail of God's desire to find expression in you. I love that line. Let me say it again. Give attention to the detail of God's desire to find expression in you. Become acquainted with perfection to accommodate yourself to the delight and good pleasure of him will transform your thoughts afresh from within. We are called to have our minds renewed, and that is really, really good news. Just because your feelings are saying one thing, hearing the lies, maybe even believing some of the lies, you can stand on true truth and from your identity declare those are lies. I'm not going to allow my mind to keep hearing them. I'm going to start to declare what God's word says about me and let him do that in and through you. And he'll direct you to patterns that will help you for a time. He's good at that. Next week, we're going to talk about the other way he accuses us, and that is to shake your identity. He wants to shake your identity so you don't know it or you don't fully believe it. It's powerful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, your word says that there's a, a battle going on. And there's a strategy, and you've actually given us the strategy. So Lord, wake us up to it. 
especially for those of us who may be wrestling with problems or uh, connecting with others who are having difficulties, be our wisdom. Be the advice that needs to be given. Can you speak truth from within to each one of us to affirm who we are in Christ? Can you teach us how to reject and turn off the radio station of accusations that can be blaring in our heads? Because that does not come from you. That is an attack from the enemy. So Lord, today I declare victory. Victory is ours. Now show us how to experience it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.